proud leader, you want to write to them and understand who the people that are reading or looking at your photos, watching your videos. To me, a tourist is someone who's content to have someone plan their trip. A traveler is someone who plans their trip themselves. And I think it's a useful distinction. There's no right or wrong between it, but it is a useful distinction between the two. Now, a traveler, I might argue that it's worth doing some planning more, uh, more and more occasionally when you can, because there is a chance that you will immerse yourself in, in a place in a, in a way that others don't access. You get your fingernails a little dirty, there's, there's, at least at times. However, the trade-off is more likely to get travel diarrhea. <laughs> Why? Why do we travel? We all do it for the same reason, I think. No matter what everyone says about it or what Walt Whitman quote they come up with, I think that shirt says it. It's fun. That's why we do it. Yes, it, can, it, can, it builds bridges and it changes our worldview and our understanding of self and home. Absolutely. That's a great thing about it. But we do it because it's fun. And I never want to lose sight of that. I made that for a, a serious conference once, just, to, just so I can remember my mind, you know, that, yeah, it's got to be fun. But I think another gift that travel plays for everyone is it's the rare opportunity for adults to play. Remember play? You know, I mean in that kind of a, a nice way. You know? <laughs> but what you're doing is simply planning fun for yourself, whether it's a magic show or throwing water balloons off Jay's roof. You know, you're, you're, you're figuring out a, a pocket of time as a kid and you play. When you're adults, you have kids, you have bills to pay, you have careers and bosses to complain about. You, you lose the chance to play. We go to movies sometimes and things like that, but travel is the time when we have that choice to build an experience that's essentially play. Some people call travel the fountain of youth. And I've been interested in this notion of that because I've always felt that when you travel to some place that's completely outside of your norm, and you go and study in a Mayan village in Guatemala and you're living with a family, that a week there feels like two or three weeks. The time seems to stretch, that it's packed with so many experiences because everything is so different from what you're used to. And so I asked a neuroscientist, as you do, um, about this. And this guy named David Eagleman, he was featured in the New Yorker magazine because he um, had been studying how people, uh, when they have a life-threatening moment, and it's like their life flashes before their eyes and everything seems to slow down, and he, he studied that and found that there was a neurological reasons why time seems to stretch our, our perception of time. So I asked him, okay, if you travel to different places, it feels to me like time's more packed. Is there anything? And he completely agreed because he said that if you travel to exotic places and do things outside your normal that are new to you, it is a sense of going back to childhood. It's a sense where we have that stretch time as kids. So if you only have one week of vacation and you challenge yourself every three times to do something completely different, it feels like a two-week vacation. That's the time of youth. You know, and so that's why I kind of like these different things. What is all this? The point of all this is I don't think that travel are isolated experiences. And we look at the travel that we do in our life, and the trips, I'm talking about travel, that we do in our lives are not disconnected experiences, but they are lined together somehow. And I call it putting together, like, you know, stepping stones, tops out, that form your travel life. No right or wrong way of doing it. If you only go and hang out with Uncle Todd in Uncle Todd's cabin, and maybe a very nice cabin, maybe it's just one stepping stone, that's fine. Or some people always go to beaches in the same place in their home countries, so they don't worry about language. But look at this guy. Wow, there's stuff all over the place. You're just trying new things and doing this, and sometimes, you know, taking tours or whatever it may be, and it's all over the place. No right or wrong, no right or wrong. And this is just my theory. But, what I think fills the matter of this travel life is what I call travel soul, right? This guy is a look. If you challenge yourself, you theoretically are learning more. It's a travel muscle that builds. When you make a mistake bargaining in Istanbul, you do it better in Bangkok. We learn, we get better through travel life and as we develop the travel muscle. Maybe it's travel soul. Now, the reason why I bring all of this crazy stuff up is to tie it back to us and that guy. Are we thinking as travel content creators or experts or leaders or writers about our careers the same way that we would maybe ask a traveler to? Are we being as active about it and thinking about intentionally about where we put those stepping stones and the decisions we make in our career? Are we being active? Are we, are we planning a lot? This guy, he looks like Weird Al. We all know Weird Al here. Yeah. You know Weird Al? Weird Al, you here? <laughs> 
The, uh, now, I got this, uh, this is a CD cover. I got the Russian market in Cambodia. It was a pirated copy. Don't worry, I immediately threw away the CD because I don't want to hear the song Lady in Red ever again. But this cover is this hilarious heavy metal cover with a guy that's cutting off the bridge to all of society so they can have a heavy metal concert back there. I love this. Greatest album cover. Greatest fake album cover of all time. I and I wonder, you know, are these the travel experts? Is this us in the future? You know, are we cutting ourselves off from the whole travel public? Or is that going to happen? Sometimes I wonder about it. When you see user-generated content, a, a travel public that's you know, growing and growing and growing and finding information easier and easier. Tony Wheeler called what we do as travel writers parachute artists, that we can drop into a place and what we've learned in one place translate to another. And we soak up the surroundings and our observations and information that we gain from it is useful once we go back home. Are the parachute artists going to stay forever? Are, are we doing all that we can now to ensure that we have careers in five or ten years? Or that the next generation will have careers in this, this, this little thing that we do. We don't want to be weird out. That's why I changed his middle finger to a heart. You know, <laughs> you know, middle, middle fingers, right? You know, we have those. We have those in the States. I, I know that not everyone uses them. But that's what he's doing there. Let's talk about experts. This is a great place to talk about what an expert is. Greece, 2,500 years ago, the theater of Dionysus, dangling gold phalluses on stage at the theater. When Aristophanes wrote a play called The Cloud, that's what, how they dress, you know that? It's okay, I put that on. This, this is literally how they dress, because they would do both genders, so that would show. I'm not sure which gender they are here, but Aristophanes was making fun of experts 2,500 years ago, just below the Acropolis. He did a play called The Clouds, in which he spoofed the, the sophists, which were the this new way of thinking versus the old traditional way of thinking. And, and basically some people were using their intellect and selling it to the elite of Athens, and he was making fun of it. And he basically he personified right and wrong in the play. The play's very raunchy, there's like fart jokes and things like that, and this kind of outfits. But ultimately wrong, of course, wins and everything falls apart. Now, he's making fun of the notion of what an expert is 2,500 years ago. So when you call yourself expert, it's kind of, it's hard to do that. It's like saying you're an intellectual or something. It's kind of, it's a tough word to talk about. But a lot of people in travel use it, and I think it's probably a useful word to think about with what we're doing. Now, by the way, the character that in the clouds, I don't know if you've read it, is he calls Socrates the example of all the sophists. Which sophism is now I considered a pejorative term. At the time, it was very serious. Because Socrates represents all of them. And there were serious ramifications for it because when Socrates went to court, they used this against him to spoof play with heart jokes, and he was eventually executed. So I guess you have to be careful what you say about expertise. I make a habit of talking to experts anything I do, any article, any video I do, I always try to find out the expert. Always, who's the expert? Who's the expert I can talk to in whatever field it is? And, and I try to quote them whenever I can too. Here's some experts I talk to. I was thinking about foodies, you know. I, I, last year I made uh, something called the Plate of Food Travel Museum on my sad blog because I, I, and I noticed that it became increasingly popular to take pictures of plates of food that you're about to eat. So I tried to put travel back into it. So I took pictures of food and then I put like travel items around it. It was a, a dramatic failure. But I went to this uh, food festival in Portland, Oregon. I said, hey, what's a foodie? You know, I, I'm really thinking about becoming a foodie. You know, how can I do that? And so, so everyone's making fun of me, of course. And these guys, the guy on the far right of this picture is a James Beard award-winning chef. I don't remember his name. He said, well, it isn't hard to eat food, right? You know, you have to have some kind of training about it. You know, this guy's a geologist with remarkable sidebars. And I asked him, are you an expert? And he said, well, uh, no, I, I can't determine if I'm an expert or not. It's up to my peers to determine. I talked to this. Am I allowed to say the word penis, Mary Jo? <laughs> penis? Is that, is that okay? I mean, if you think of the Acropolis Museum, I mean, that is such just an unbelievable penis fest. I, 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 I had a photo of a centaur kicking a man in the, the area, which was just rude. This is the Thalological Museum in Iceland, so I went to, to there, this is a guy who collects penis specimens of all animals, and he had just gotten a human specimen, and he was going to retire. And he was in a little <laughs> waiting village, and I went to talk to him in a very serious conversation. This is what travel does, you know, serious stuff. And um, I went to talk to him, you know, why penises, you know, how do you get started in this, and he is hilarious. He is hilarious. 
But I asked him the key question, being a penis in a non-sexualized way, by the way. Um, expert, I wanted to find out. And a lot of times when I interview people, and if I'm writing something down and I'm doing video, what I do is I, you find that they get into this thing where they feel like they're on camera and they're recording everything you do. And so I'll, I'll just, eventually I'll act like I'm not recording film anymore, or I'm not writing anymore. I'll just look up and just ask a question. Like, yeah, this must be a dream job or something. And then you get this really great response. And that's how you trick them. And I asked him, I said, yeah, I had a video, and I was going, why are penises so funny? And he's going, oh, God, I wish I knew the answer to that. And then he went on this long missive about the historical motifs and literature and all this stuff, and he clearly had thought a lot about this, and he didn't have the answer. That's a sign of an expert. I'm always willing to learn. I love this guy. This guy's hilarious. It's great. A little bit more on experts. I talked to an expert raker, you know, I wanted to find out raking skills. He works at a Japanese garden in Portland and he, he, he creates these kind of ripples that look like water and pebbles. And he quoted this guy, a Japanese gardener, who said, that ah, you can be an expert. Yeah, it's easy. It takes 200 years. So when we talk about expert, I just want to know what experts say. None of them admitted to being an expert. They were absolutely hungry for more knowledge. And they talked about that they can talk more to, to people because they know more than other people, but it doesn't make them an expert. Think about the food. All you have to do is eat food. Isn't that your food? He travels similar to that. What can we do to make sure that we can be an expert in this field, that we can be seen as one? Point behind that. This is interesting. Look, Alexandra Horowitz, she did a walk around a neighborhood that she lives in New York City and was very familiar, didn't pay attention to it all. And she did it with 11 experts. And she was. She went with a child to see her neighborhood from a children's perspective. She went with a geologist so that she could see the concrete and see the life and organic material in something that seemed dead to her. She went with a font expert to talk about all the science and things like that. She had, a lot of her book is talking about what expertise is and basically how experts are seeing a scene in a more meaningful way. How are we seeing travel in a more meaningful way? When someone gives us a FUD shot, do we understand that that's not necessarily a novelty or you know, saltwater taffy? that it's similar to other places, that we see the lines behind it. How can we do that? And one of the ways that she talks about that's Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, there's a very serious journal here called the British Psychological Society. And uh, they talk about what an expert is, literally defining what is an expert. You can see, no one has any agreement on this stuff, and I find it hilarious. And they basically boil it down to this. It's a certain manner of practice plus a certain amount of talent equals expertise, more or less. Now, the, the big debate is, is how much of it is innate. Like, Sherlock Holmes may be smarter than some people. But I think for travel, we can throw that out and focus on that top practice. We can think about that ourselves as we do our careers and as your travel. Practice. To me, reading is a little bit like, I hope this is okay that I'm saying this, a little bit like the tours. They're allowing other people to say things and they soak it up. They're letting other people curate their trips. Reading is part of it. It's not enough. It's not enough. You've got to experiment. You've got to get your fingernails dirty. You've got to go out and fail and test a little bit, I think, to be an expert. You've got to experiment. You've got to practice. And so I bring this up when we think about our careers and everything we do. I mean, are we practicing? You know, how do you practice travel? Drinking beer on stage? <laughs> Going and looking at naughty centaurs? <laughs> Are travel experts necessary? I did a spoof of travel experts of a video series last year called The Right Pants. I got tens of views. Um, and, uh, people who are not really uh, travel experts, not spoofs of them, I guess. But um, with travel experts, the first thing I want to say is when I was at Lonely Planet, I got invited to go uh, to the Melbourne office when it was based in Melbourne. And there was 12 of us, and we were kicking around a thought leadership statement for Lonely Planet, a statement that would typify what Lonely Planet is. By the way, if the Lonely Planet people are here, I do have permission to talk about this. I did ask Tom, so I'm not going to get in trouble, I think. It's okay. Just, you know, okay. <laughs> so we kicked around for two days, like what a thought leadership statement is, which is basically like the values that is being talked about today in the, in the, um, for the videos this morning that a statement that informed anything you do, a business decision, a top 10 list you make, a guidebook you do, a partnership you consider, anything that you do is just informed by this kind of statement that you hit like a high five understanding what you do. After two days we came up with, we understand the world better than anyone else. Okay, that's powerful, I like that, that's good. Only Planet doesn't use that anymore, but I know who can. 
We can't. Travel can't. Because travel understands the world better than anyone else. When you think why travel experts are necessary, why travel is necessary, think about what traditional media can't get. When you cover the world, okay, the, the mayor of Athens, what did he say the first day? The traditional media, there was a certain perception that he felt was inaccurate or incomplete of what was happening in Athens. He turned to travel. That's great. That's exactly his point. One of the most powerful things that I think I did as a, the spokesperson of Walnut Planet is when there was the oil spill uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Serious stuff, I guess. Uh, BP oil spill about five years ago, four years ago. And it happened, and all you saw in the news was this bubbling oil offshore. And you saw, you know, these reports of tar balls and, and, and the appending doom and the fire of this photo. That's all you saw. And it was hitting 1,800 miles of coastline the Gulf of Mexico, which was just recovering from Hurricane Katrina, an area that almost all of its economy is about tourism. And of the people that go, 90% of the people have been three, four, five, six times before. In other words, they're filling out their whole life on the stepping stones of this place. And what happened? Immediately, people immediately started canceling their trips. Now, about, at that point, 20 miles of 1,800 miles of shoreline had been hit in any way from, from, from the oil. So I begged one of the planners to go just to talk and report about it from a travel perspective of what's happening on the beach. Now there was test crews that were testing the water every day, etc. And this Kansan family from Kansas, right there, these people, I talked to them, why are you here? And they said, well, I wanted to come because I've come here all of my life and I love this beach. And if it's going to get hit and ruined, I want to see it before it happens. And if it doesn't, I want to be here. And if it does hit, I'll go further down the coast. And if it does, if it hits there, I'll go inland. I wanted my kids to see this. Uh, travel's not a contest, but those guys come on. We really, really like them. So why am I bringing this up? Because we got on national TV talking about it right before Obama was on the beach talking about this, and we're the only travel publishing people that I know of that cover this. Travel knows the world, understands the world better than anyone else. Offering an alternative view to what's out there. I see that not as just something on the side. I see it as a, as a responsibility and, a, and almost a privilege, really, for what we do. You close your eyes right now and you listen to the soundscape of, of the, the world travel, and you hear footsteps everywhere. Little lights of community exchange between all cultures and all towns and all roads. Travel is everywhere. It is everywhere. I mean, it bottles at certain places, and it reaches almost everywhere in a way that traditional media doesn't because they chase events. Not putting down media, but we're filling a gap that they don't have. This is Cleveland. Every time there's an article about poor little Cleveland, they call it a mistake by the lake, and they talk about the fire, the river catching on fire in 1969. It's the second, it's a positive phrase in the second paragraph of almost every article. But Cleveland did something about it. You can kayak, there's fish life back there. You know that by going there. The most important thing I've done in my career is going to Burma during the boycott. A lot of people did it, they didn't know what to do with it. I went and covered it for Only Planet and talked about how you can go there and keep your money in private hands. And I tried on two trips for six weeks anonymously traveling around over and over.